Hi, this is a special Alt Shift X live stream to talk about the new trailer for the second Denis Villeneuve Dune movie, Dune Part 2. I'm here with a special guest, YouTuber Quinn from Quinn's Ideas. Thanks for coming on, Quinn. No problem, man. Anytime. How's it going, guys? It's great to be back on this channel. Super excited for the trailer. Super excited to talk to you about it. Yeah, we've got heaps to cover, lots of surprises in this trailer. Uh, this will be a bit of a spoilery live stream. We will talk about events that'll happen in the upcoming movie. Uh, so, you know, all of that first book, all of that next movie, we will mention some big events from it. But uh, don't let that worry you. It's a bit like the prescience uh, that Paul has in the Dune movie. Frank Herbert spoils half of Dune's story in the first few chapters himself. So uh, embrace the visions of the future. True. Be like Paul. And I, and I feel like between the three trailers, if you're watching them and engaging with content on them, like you probably know what's up anyway. Because they do kind of show a lot. The trailers have shown a lot. I feel like if you could take all the little bits and piece them together, you might have a good chunk of the movie's narrative. Yeah, yeah, I was surprised by um, how many shots we got of the final battle for for Arrakis with the sandworms attacking the Sardaukar. I thought that was done beautifully. Yeah, or even like the nuclear uh, weapons thing. We got that in the last trailer, but I was surprised that they even showed that because that's also like a pretty big moment in the book that you would expect them to not maybe show in a trailer to like reserve showing that for the moment. But I did hear that this movie, the runtime is like two hours and 46 minutes or something like that. So it's a lot longer than the first movie. It's yeah. Blade Runner 2049 length. So um, it's possible that there's like so much in the movie that this we think we're seeing like all the exciting moments. But maybe there's a lot more that, that remain to be seen. Yeah. Yeah. They, they It's interesting that this second movie is going to be so long because like the first movie i feel like they cut out so much from the first half of the first dune book um whereas the second movie they're expanding it and adding all of this stuff that wasn't in the book so it's quite a different kind of adaptation that they're doing with this second movie yeah i mean i was saying that i i thought that um with the first movie it did seem like they were kind of treading lightly like they didn't want to like make the movie too long they didn't want to include too many weird things they didn't want to include too much that would i think scare away like the average movie goer um and i think that villeneuve is a little bit freer with this one and i think he's putting more of his own like ideas in it as well and you know uh, he has said that it's more of like a a war movie which as you know the all the action scenes in the dune book are very understated it's very like happening in the background um but i imagine that the movie will focus a lot more on those types of sequences i imagine that will be a lot more in the moment when it comes to these action scenes um because it yeah like i said it happens in the background in the book mostly yeah i, I mean part of the fun for me of the dune book is that everything is so sort of yeah subtle and indirect and and internal focusing on thoughts and conversations right up until the climactic ending where all of this violence and action explodes out of nowhere and it's shocking when when that happens all at once um it sounds like the second dune movie is not going to have that um so much because that it looks like there are many many action set pieces uh, rather than just the big climactic one at the end yeah i mean yeah it looks like they're going to be really getting into you know maybe what stillgar was doing with the smugglers and you know they're going to be getting into like several clashes between the harkonnens and um the fremen so we're gonna it's a so it's, it's i feel like the movie is about the war between the fremen and the harkonnens at its heart that's what this film is i think yeah they're certainly focusing on um a lot of other different side stories within the war uh, let, let us know in the live chat if there are any audio issues. Apparently Quinn is louder, so I'll adjust that. Um, yeah, well, we did see more of, like, Gurney with the smugglers, and we've seen a bunch of shots throughout the trailers of, uh, you know, Paul and Charney with their missile launcher rocket weapon attacking this spice harvester, which, you know, the sort of the twist of that in the book is that 
uh, this is Gurney and the smugglers who are being attacked by Paul and Charney and the Fremen, and they only realize. Paul only realizes after slaughtering half of Gurney's men that, oh, this isn't my enemy, this isn't the Harkonnens, this is my good friend Gurney Halleck, and I've just killed Gurney a bunch Halleck. of his dudes. And so I, I hope they sort of capture the surprise and the weirdness of that conflict. Yeah. In the movie. I, I love the fact that Gurney Halleck was, you know, making his way on Arrakis, you know, getting in good with the smugglers and, you know, being a survivor. He wasn't going to let Arrakis destroy him. So I, I really like that aspect, and I'm glad that is something that is being shown in this film as well. I really like Gurney Halleck as a character. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's all about that getting in tune with the environment type stuff. I, I thought the design of his um, still suit, or I suppose this is like a spice mining outfit that he's wearing here, um, I thought was kind of interesting. Because th this outfit looks reminiscent of some of the Sardaukar outfits we saw. Uh, with the big sort of glass dome helmet design. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting seeing him in that get up. Like, it shows that he's not Fremen, you know, because the smugglers exist in this sort of in-between worlds where they where they are not as attuned to the environment as the Fremen are. They're sort of these interlopers between, um, like, you know, the Imperials and the Harkonnens and the Fremen. Yeah. And they're, they're in this really interesting position. Yeah. Uh, definitely. Um, yeah. Uh, One it, of the adjacent groups. Yeah. It, it's interesting, uh, you know, we, we've got all these shots of there's this big, like, nuclear explosion happening in front of Paul, uh, but there's also these shots of ornithopters firing on the shield wall to, like, break the shield wall mountains. And, and it's interesting that these are, like, two separate events because... Uh, to my understanding, Paul uses the family nuclear weapons to blow up the shield wall. Break the shield wall, yeah. But we also see yeah, this still... additional attack with the ornithopters attacking the shield wall. As though it's like two separate attacks. I'm kind of puzzled by that because I thought that was all just one atomic strike that Paul did, does. Yeah, in the book it definitely is. I'm not sure. Maybe this was some other incident or maybe they were using these bombs for a different purpose i guess it remains to be seen because i can't pick out any specific moment in the book that this could potentially be yeah it's puzzling. but i do know i do know that there are going to probably be some significant changes from the book what one one thing that i'm pretty sure is not going to happen is i'm pretty sure they're not going to give because you said we were going to talk about spoilers yeah i'm pretty sure they're not going to give paul and chani that first leto I'm pretty sure we're not going to see the baby that is killed in the raid, right? So um, I'd be shocked if that was in the movie. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So, so for those who haven't read the book, um, at one point there is a time skip and we find that Paul and Charney have had a baby that they name Leto, uh, but this baby Leto is killed in a Harkonnen raid. And it's it's kind of a weird little subplot that happens because, you know, we don't get to see this baby and not much. It, it, it's just something that sort of happens off screen. It, it's born and then it dies. And it's kind of a motivation for Paul to go against the Harkonnens, I guess. But it's not like he needed additional motivation. So it's this really weird exactly. little subplot that happens. And it also makes the it also makes the naming scheme confusing because there is a second Leto the second when Paul and Chani have yeah. another baby, also called Leto. So Leto the second is actually kind of really Leto the third. It's just a very confusing additional plot that the I... The initial... The... I can Sorry see them interrupt. cutting it yeah. out, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, the initial child almost feels like an afterthought in the original Doom book. It's like, oh, and then they, they also had a child that got killed. And then, yeah, it makes it even weirder that he does name the other kid Leto. <laughs> Weird and confusing. Almost like he was like, oh, I lost that one. I'll, I guess I'll replace it with another one. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, I, I guess what they are increasing the focus on is Charney and Paul's relationship. Um, they're definitely focusing this around their intimacy and their love, which is something that we don't see a lot of in the first Dune book. Um, the the sort of tragedy and the payoff for Paul and Charney's love comes more in the second book. 
spoilers when you know charlie johnny dies in childbirth and then paul walks into the desert um and and so it's kind of weird that they're focusing so much on Paul and Chani's love in the first book. They're changing it because they're adding this conflict, it seems, where Chani is in opposition to Paul's role as a prophet. We see Chani say, this prophecy is how they enslave us. And I love this shot because we can see all the Fremen like heads bowed in prayer. And she's like standing and, and, and yelling at her people saying, you know, stop praying and open your eyes to the yeah. truth that we are being manipulated. Which is which is I a really read... big change. Johnny doesn't do this in the book. Yeah, it's certainly a departure, and it is a change that I definitely like because, like you said, they're doing a lot. I think in this movie to develop um, Paul and Johnny's relationship and to add more, you know, dynamics to it, um, which I really like. Um, so um, yeah, I think I think this is something that's needed for this movie. You need someone to be at the opposition to Paul, right? Because these Fremen. Um, including Stilgar, I think are really invested in this idea of this Lisan al Gaib, this voice from the outer world, this person that's going to come in and free them from oppression. Um, so they're really invested in this idea. So although like Chani is definitely completely right, the prophecy definitely enslaves them, the Bene Gesserit sowed those myths to manipulate the Fremen, I think that what she's saying is mostly going to fall on Death's on deaf ears because it's it, you're dealing with fanaticism there's a line that comes from one of the other trailers from stilgar where he basically says it's not clear who he's talking to but he's saying i don't care what you believe this is what i believe because it's not just it's not just the fact that he believes he wants to believe he needs to believe because he they see it as the only path forward the only path to their freedom and at this point they're so close so I can't imagine that Paul is actually going to, that Chani, I mean, is actually going to cause any change in the minds of the Fremen that she's like kind of proselytizing here too. Yeah, I agree because in the book, it's very abstract and subtle, this idea that, oh yeah, there's a prophecy of the savior, but it's really dangerous and it's actually not in the Fremen's interests. And we, we learn about these ideas mostly through Paul's thoughts. And that's really difficult to show in a movie. So I, I think it does make sense to change Chinese character to make her the character who is, who is trying to prevent the Fremen from being swept up in this um, cult of personality around Paul and this, and this jihad that is coming. And I think that the sense of her like struggling and failing to save the Fremen from being swept up in Paul's messianic leadership. I think that'll give us a really like strong emotional sense of the theme. You know, it, it, it connects this abstract theme to an actual character's motivations in a way that I think makes sense. So yeah, it's, it's quite a bold change from the book, but I, I think it is needed to make people really understand what this story is about. And this story is about the danger of political and religious uh leaders having too much power and too much influence yeah someone asks how can johnny be a skeptic and yet stand by paul through dune messiah and my answer to that is because she they love each other she's in love with paul atreides and that actually does mean a lot for human beings when you're like in love with somebody so even though she doesn't agree with what he's doing necessarily she still loves him and she's willing to stand by him at least I think it would be the deal because like like we said it's different in the book. I mean that that I think is what could make it interesting, right? Like there's so much more drama there if Chani loves Paul as a person but hates his cult of personality and his messianic leadership. That's a really interesting tension for Chani. Like in the book Chani mostly sort of just blindly has faith in Paul as well as loving Paul. She doesn't really question his uh, his leadership and vision. H having having a tension in the movie canon is potentially interesting. I, I thought it was really interesting in this trailer when Paul says to Chani, my allegiance is, is to you. Do you believe me? And, and, and I think sort of part of the implication here is that Paul is loyal to Chani, but he's not necessarily loyal to the best interests of the Fremen. Because Chani talks in this trailer about you know, the Fremen act for the good of the Fremen, 
for the mutual benefit mm-hmm. of the Fremen. Whereas Paul, I, I think part of the reason she says that is because Paul is not acting in the best interests of the Fremen. He's saying to Chani, yeah. I love you specifically, but he's making no promises about the best interests of the Fremen collective. Yeah. One Which... of my favorite lines... Oh, sorry. Go on. I was just going to say one of my favorite lines in the entire Dune saga, and it comes from Children of Dune, paraphrasing. It's when Paul is having a conversation with his son, Leto II, in the desert. And Leto says to Paul, it's a shame you were never really Fremen, father, or something like that. Yeah. Um, and it's just like such a stab at Paul Atreides, because he, he was never really Fremen. He was yeah. utilizing the Fremen. He was harnessing desert power, but he was not Fremen in the same way that his children were Fremen, being, you know, the children of Fremen, the children of a Fremen woman, and then also having those Fremen ancestral memories. They were really Fremen in the way that Paul never actually was. So I, I always thought that was really interesting. Yeah, that that's, I, I think, a great point, is that Paul, you know, th- this story is about Paul becoming Fremen, quote unquote, and like learning the way of the desert and becoming a part of this people as is fitting for a hero's journey you know it, it, so many so many stories about heroes are about a hero joining an a, another world a fantastical world and and becoming the ruler of it but part of the subversion of that fantasy trope is that paul isn't really a true fremen acting in true fremen values i mean i guess he is in the sense that he walks into the desert in the end i mean that is about him affirming fremen values but but nonetheless in many ways Paul isn't a real Fremen, he's LARPing. He's taking on the appearance of a Fremen in order to use the Fremen. And so that's, I agree, it's so great when he's told that he was never quite a true Fremen. You know, he was just Lawrence yeah. of Arabia. He was just a European wearing this local desert people appearances without necessarily having the heart of it. Yeah, absolutely. Paul is such a complex and interesting character. And I'm really excited that it's basically official that Villeneuve is pushing for the Dune Messiah movie. He's almost done with the script and he really wants to get to at least the ending of Dune Messiah to kind of give an ending to the Paul Atreides saga. Because I think Villeneuve sees Messiah as the end of Paul Atreides. And he would be right in a way because you could argue that like when he walks into the desert, it's the death of Paul Atreides and the beginning of, you know, the prophet. So yeah, just I'm very curious to see if we can get the Dune Messiah movie and to see like how that unfolds on screen in Villeneuve fashion. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've talked before about how Dune Messiah is such a strange book. Um, mm-hmm. I'm very curious to see if it gets made into a movie, what it would be like. I, I also found it interesting in the trailer, this, this stuff where Chani says that, you know, you, Paul, you come from this aristocratic world of dukes and great houses and you know blood you know lineage is how you get power whereas we the fremen we are equal and we work for the benefit of all and i thought that was interesting because you know it's definitely true that in the book the fremen have a focus on acting for the interests of the group of the tribe sometimes you got to sacrifice an individual for the sake of uh, the good of the tribe and the fremen collective um and the book connects that to some Islamic concepts as well of istisla. I'm I'm no Islamic scholar, but there are certain Islamic terms that are used by Frank Herbert in the book um, to connect the ideology of the Fremen to ideas of general interest and in, in, in ideas of law and common good. Um, but it's also interesting, like this idea of Fremen all being equal, because in some senses the fremen are a meritocracy there's the idea that the leader is the one who is strong who is most able to provide for the group um but when you look at who the leaders of the fremen are they kind of are an aristocratic family not unlike the great houses because the the great leaders of the fremen who we know of in the books are there's like pardo kinds who taught them about ecology, mm-hmm. and then there's Pardo's son, Liet Kynes, Liet. Who, who is a woman uh, in the first Dune movie, and then Stilgar, who becomes the leader of all the Fremen in Dune Book One. Uh, he is the uncle of Chani, or possibly the great uncle, depending on who you ask. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, Paul 
uh, marries Chani and become, well doesn't marry Chani but Paul has a relationship with Chani and he's the leader so if you actually look at who the leaders of the Fremen are they're all related it's one big yeah. family group of Fremen ruling all the Fremen so like it is quite a lot like one of the aristocracies of the great houses I think so that so think it's yeah go on I was just going to say, I, I think it's really hard for human beings to avoid nepotism. You know, I feel like yeah. it's almost like a natural thing. You think this guy was a great leader. Perhaps his son will be a great leader. And I think humans naturally gravitate towards that kind of thinking when picking leaders. Yeah. And that's a point that Frank makes in the books over and over is that even even a good political system is subject to corruption and you know power uh destroying you know values and integrity and and so i you know it is compatible with the books that you get issues like that but um yeah i i think it's a really i think it's interesting that this line is in the trailer talking about these you know values of the fremen about equality and the general good and, and i think that probably the purpose for it is that Part of this story is about how Paul's influence and Paul's leadership eventually corrupts the values of the Fremen, and it ultimately damages and degrades Fremen culture. And so the great triumph of the Fremen ultimately leads to the, the, the destruction of what made them who they are. So, so I think that's probably why they're talking about Fremen values here, to show their degradation later. Yeah, almost um, certainly. And what, it was interesting what you were saying about the Fremen earlier um, and their values and how, you know, the tribe is more important than the individual. Um, there is a specific quote that, I, that I'm kind of blanking on now, but essentially it's talking about how you cut away the rot so that the whole is stronger. Yeah. You know, the Fremen only take in what makes them stronger, right? So that's why um, in, the begin in, in Dune, when they encounter Paul and Jessica in the desert, they're going to kill Jessica at first until she demonstrates her usefulness to the Fremen. She demonstrates that she knows the weirding way. And when they recognize that there is that she has something to offer, then they're like, okay, we can we can work with this. But they're yeah. very utilitarian, which is I think is a strong is what makes them which is part of what makes them so strong. Yeah. And that's a philosophy that comes up throughout all the books and from a bunch of different organizations. You know the Bene like like this evolutionary idea that you have to, um, that that the strong has to triumph to pass on the not only the genetics but like the ideological ideas, um, the political structures. Like the strong survives so that the species can survive collectively, and it's quite a brutal, hard philosophy. I think like I think we've talked before about how Dune is very much a story about superhuman individuals who have superhuman yeah. abilities of prescience and combat and, and dune is not a series that cares very much about average people and just the, mm -hmm. the you know the vast majority of people in this universe are these peasants who have no rights and no power and the books are not very interested in them this is a story about superhumans triumphing for the good of the species or the survival of the species supposedly so yeah. you know I, I think it's interesting to think about that philosophy at the heart of this story yeah, it's definitely about exceptional people right and that goes back all the way to like you know you know why there's no machines not no no, no thinking machines in the series because frank herbert was very concerned or very interested in you know how far can humans evolve themselves and how like you know basically awesome can we become like how far mentally can we stretch ourselves how far physically can we stretch ourselves so he's really only concerned with the people that have stretched themselves the most you know like the mintats and the Benny Gesserit, all these sick freaks and weirdos that have like really yeah. pushed what it is to be human to like the very very limits like he's i think frank herbert was just kind of obsessed with that idea because yeah. it's an idea that he, he continues to play with in the later books too so yeah, I think that goes all the way down to like what he the idea that he had when he was first conceptualizing the whole thing. Yeah, a, a celebration of human exceptionalism. I, I mm -hmm. guess you could call it. So some other cool stuff in the trailer. Uh, I I enjoy how Paul says, you know, the trailer is uh, framed by these dreams and nightmares that Paul is having, these visions of the future that he's oh, having. So good. 
and he's talking about how the visions it's only fragments and it's not clear what is happening in these visions and in a fun meta kind of way these fragmentary unclear visions that paul is describing that's just like the trailer the trailer itself is a bunch of fragmentary visions of different shots of this of the future of this movie we're about to see so it's quite meta about um the trailer itself i really appreciate it that they it's said in the trailer that paul is seeing a bunch of all these possible futures i'm glad that was said because i feel like people have argued with me before when i've said that paul is seeing a bunch of possible futures and you know picking one you know and so i'm glad that they kind of they're establishing that fact in this movie that he sees multiple futures and he chooses the one to go down and i really really loved when he when he was talking about how he saw one narrow path forward um and the thing about that narrow path is that although most of the other paths lead to you know just the destruction of house atreides and victory for house harkonnen maybe most of those other paths don't lead to the devastating events that, go, that are going to take place later in the human universe the path for what's interesting is that the path for the survival of house atreides is not a path that benefits most of humanity and yeah. paul knows this and yet he's choosing to go forward with this path anyway because he's more concerned with avenging house atreides so that is absolutely key in paul's character and i like the fact that that's in the trailer paul had paul has the ultimate choice here it's like the reverend mother also says in the trailer we've never seen power in our world like this the power of the quiz at Tadarak. so yeah <laughs> getting serious in this one yeah yeah and, and and paul is very aware in the books especially that this future that he's fighting for the survival of house atreides also carries the risk of a holy war, a jihad, killing trillions of people across the galaxy. So uh, it, it, there is a selfishness to the path that Paul is trying to is is trying to find. It's for his survival, but it also carries these enormous risks. I, I really like uh, the shots of water and waves uh, in this trailer as well, because you know waves are this motif that connects to sand dunes. Um, and is also connected to descriptions of time. So in the books, Paul's prescient vision of the future is often compared to water in how it's, it's fluctuating, it's ever-changing, it's evolving, shifting currents, waves, surges, and countersurges, like surf against rocky cliffs, a boiling of possibilities. So you get this very dynamic sense of his future vision. It's not just some static, certain path. It's it's something that's very dangerous and uncertain and constantly moving, which I think the waves yeah. capture quite nicely. Yeah, absolutely. Like he mentions the yeah, the way it's described in the book, it's almost like it makes you feel like you can you know how it feels to be prescient. Because when he's talking about like sometimes being able to see a clean path ahead and then sometimes the vision may be being blocked by, you know, like a wave and not being able to see like all the way in the future. So that's really interesting. Um, and also it's, um, I think almost every trailer so far has like hinted really heavily at the, the spice agony because obviously Paul becomes really connected with his prescient abilities after he undergoes the spice agony. So I'm curious to see that. And I'm pretty sure, not pretty sure, but I think that could be what we see when we see the, that line of, uh, what looks like Benny Jesuit Reverend Mothers and Sayadinas and Paul walking up to them. I think that might be him going to do the Spice Agony, which would be a departure from the book because in the book he does it, I think, either alone or with Chani. I'm kind of blanking on it a little bit, but yeah. Yeah, if I remember rightly, Paul just kind of YOLOs and does the sandworm drowning and makes the water of life and takes it. Um, without telling anyone, uh, which is yeah. incredibly dangerous. And he ends up being comatose for weeks um, before he emerges with his vision unlocked. But yeah, as you say, it, it does look as though Paul might be coming to the Sayadinas for that purpose. And I, an I, epic scene. and I really enjoy the costumes and the appearance, the designs of these of these Fremen priestesses here, because they, they look to me as though these might be the Sayadinas, the priestesses from all these different Fremen tribes across Arrakis, as though these leaders have all gathered from across the planet to come together to, you know, test Paul or to meet Paul. Um, 
and that central one, I, I think, is Jessica, because, you know, Jessica becomes one of the Sayadina after the Water of Life ritual. I think that's her costume there. There's a great line in the book um, when Paul is in the coma, and again, paraphrasing, but it's something like, and so begin the myth that Paul Muad'Dib was both dead and alive. Because yeah. he goes into this coma, and they're like, is he dead? He's alive? Is he alive? And then he finally wakes up. So it's obviously, you know... Uh, like Jesus, he's like he's like dying and then being re and then waking up and you know being reincarnated or you know what I mean. It's like wait, rising from the dead like a Messiah would. Yeah. So on yeah, the on the third that was day. An interesting part. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, Frank borrows from so many different traditions and cultures. Absolutely. Which is so cool. Um, this particular vision, I, I think in other trailers we've seen some similar shots of what appears to be jessica walking around and then paul like coming up coming up a dune behind her and it, it, it's it has this sort of nightmarish quality where it looks like paul is, is is trying to run up and reach his mother but you know he doesn't quite reach her so you know i, I wonder what the what's going on here why is paul trying to reach his mother it, it almost feels to me as though you know, Jessica has undergone the spice agony. She has changed into a Sayadina. She's become a reverend mother. And that, in some sense, dehumanizes her. Uh, it, it, it makes her something other than, than human and something other than Jessica's mother, wh uh, than Paul's mother, which is something they explored really well in the first movie, I think. Because in the first movie, you know, Leto was asking Jessica, hey, like, are you uh, my lover and Paul's mother and someone lo who's loyal to us, or are you a Bene Gesserit who was loyal to the Bene Gesserit and their plans? And I think now that yeah. Jessica undergoes this transformation, that, that question becomes even sharper. It's like, is Jessica acting in Paul's interests and in her family's interests, or is she some superhuman Bene Gesserit gigabrain who's going to manipulate events for, for the sake of their plans? I, w I wonder if, in well, that sense, Jessica is estranged from Paul and he's trying to reach her again in this vision. So, can we go, like, all the way with spoilers? Like, because I want to mention something about Jessica's parentage. Is that okay? Yeah, let's let's uh, let's do spoilers. Spoiler warning, spoiler warning. Spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. So, so what's interesting about that is when Jessica's mind would is awakened by the spice agony, she would have the voice of the Reverend Mother guy's Helen Mohayim. <laughs> Yeah, who is true. Her mother in her mind, right? So when we talk about like Jessica's loyalty and whether or not she would be loyal to the Bene Gesserit or not, that's a very close ancestor, right there in her mind, speaking to her at all times. So um, I feel like that kind of speaks to like some of the events that maybe happen later in the series, maybe in like Children of Dune, as far as like Jessica's allegiance is concerned. So yeah, I think that's uh, that's that's pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I would note that, to the best of my knowledge, in the books written by Frank Herbert, it doesn't say who Jessica's mother is. It doesn't say, but I feel like it's kind of implied, because the Bene Gesserit don't really get to know who their parents are. Yeah. So I would guess if, 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 if anything would have been in Frank Herbert's notes that his son took and put in the other books, I think it would have been, that would have been one of the things if I had to guess. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that. I think that's reasonable because it is in the prequel Dune books written by Frank Herbert's son, Brian Herbert. Um, that is where it says that Gaius is mm -hmm. Jessica's mother. But yeah, I agree. It's it's probably something that Frank planned but just didn't mention in the, in the main books. Yeah, I just think about the relationship between Gaius and Jessica. Um, we know that um, Gaius directly trained Jessica we know that she said Jessica was her greatest student, and I really think there is an episode, there is an element to Gaius that she was she was very disappointed when she sees what Jessica has done. She's very disappointed in it, <laughs> yeah. in her, almost like her mother would be disappointed in her daughter. She's like, oh, I had I had hopes in you. She almost seems like a bitter mom that's like angry. I, I yeah. agree with that, and and, and isn't mm -hmm. in the first book it doesn't Gaius weep a little bit when she and she's sort of weeping for jessica and the danger that the atreides are going into and so that 
th- there is this sense in their relationship of that of that tension mm-hmm. again between like are we a family looking out for our family or are we these superhuman Bene Gesserits looking after the species in this grand plan that we have? I, I, I mean, I, I think that you know they're called Reverend Mothers, right? So a Reverend Mother is yeah. in some sense a mother to all of humanity. Like they are these Absolutely. puppeteers, but they are also these caretakers and these guides. And the idea is that the Bene Gesserit, at least they see themselves as this teacher and as this maternal teaching figure that tries to guide humanity towards enlightenment and survival and, and self-control and all of these values. And so, and so, yeah, like Ga- Gaius may be literally Jessica's mother, but I think Gaius and, the, and all the Reverend Mothers are sort of symbolically they see themselves as the mothers to all humanity. Well, that's definitely how they, they see themselves. You know, they, they definitely think that they're doing everything they do for the better betterment of humans and humanity, right? Um, that's the whole thing behind the Kwisatz Haderach is that the, the Bene Gesserit have this vision for how they think humans should move forward as a species. And they want to use the Kwisatz Haderach to, be, to like best enact that vision. You know, they want to use his power to make it happen, basically. Um, so yeah, they definitely see themselves as as the matriarchs of the human universe. They definitely see, you know, most humans as just like silly humans that they yeah. need to kind of keep in line and you know keep them in check and manipulate. I, I like um I don't remember what book it is, but it's the Bene Gesserit responding to some other group, maybe the Tleilaxu or the Ixians or something, and they basically um, send them a note and all they say is you will be punished. <laughs> and it just reminded me like that's so like grandma or like mom just like you will be punished it's like that's all they send it's like and, and they just know they're going to be punished these witches are going to mess us up in some way and they're absolutely going to follow through on their um threat so yeah the Bene Gesserit are the mommies of the Dune universe <laughs> yeah yeah and and it all connects back to Frank Herbert's childhood with these Jesuit yeah. nuns who raised him and taught him and it's all reaching deep into the Jungian archetypes in in Frank's yeah. brain, I think it's it's wonderful. I, I I love how I love how harsh and rational Dune is, but at the same time, it has such an emotional, relatable heart to it deep down, which um I think is really lovely. Absolutely. Uh, well, I think it's it's because Frank Herbert kept the story a human story, right? He really wanted to explore aspects of humanity. And I think that's what makes Dune like really interesting because we, we are really dealing with like human characters. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, in the constant reach for exceptionalism, that there is always those like human foibles that, that you know, ground us again. And, and Chani embodies part of that. Chani's love bringing Paul back to reality is so important. There's a lot of Irulan in this trailer. Oh, yeah. Looking Th- good. This shot's interesting. It looks like she's on Kaitan, the Imperial Carino planet, based on the trees that are behind them. And uh, she appears to be reading yeah. a message. Yeah, I'm not sure what she's holding in her hand right there. It could be a message of some kind. What, what I'm seeing from all the trailers and stuff and what's been released so far. Like I read the transcript of the first 10 minutes of the movie. Um, it seems like Irulan is kind of acting almost in an advisory role to her father. Like he takes her more seriously. It seems like than like in the book maybe. Right. So um, yeah, so that's, that's interesting. And I'm very excited to see Irulan's role as um, a scholar. Right. Because she seems yeah. very interested in what the truth is about what actually went down on Arrakis. Like, she wants to record the real history of it all. Uh, and that makes sense to me that Irulan would have that drive because we see so much of, like, what she wrote about the events on Arrakis and Paul Atreides, like, throughout, you know, Dune. Yeah. So which, very excited which, to see this performance. Which is interesting because Dune, the Dune books explore how history and historians are often wrong. Um and I believe there's a point in Dune Book 4 where God Emperor Leto executes a bunch of historians, doesn't he? Doesn't he horribly yeah. execute a bunch of them? And, yeah, and there's also... Yeah. And there's also, like, an interview with a historian at the beginning of some the beginning. editions of Book 4, I believe, where 
this historian is telling the truth and he gets killed for telling the truth and 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 so dune has always been interested in you know how history is recorded and um and what the nature of truth is absolutely absolutely i like this little message tube that irulan is looking at there isn't anything quite like that described in the books but you know it, it definitely connects with that Benny Gesserit vibe of you know secret messages and secret codes like the braille on the leaf and all of these little hidden things um i wonder if that's you know some kind of bene gesserit way to send secret messages to each other maybe you've got to unlock that tube with some secret pressure bene gesserit thing um i think I that's quite appropriate how, I, I believe it's heretics where one of the bene gesserit sisters has like a it's like a special hood or she has something in her hood where she's having a message projected and she can like read it. Yeah. Um, I forget exactly when that takes place, but I'm like, what is this wild technology? Yeah. Yeah. There's lots of, of really cool ways that the Bene Gesserit communicate that are interesting because they're very subtle about their messages. And sometimes it's like messages within messages. They have to have ways of ways of weaving secrets in, in ways that can't be detected by non Bene Gesserit. Yeah. Which I guess is all about the theme of the power of knowledge, because it all comes back to the power of the mind being the greatest kind of power. So, of course, information and messages are supremely important. Um, we, yeah, Gaius, Gaius tells Irulan that this is a form of power that our world has not yet seen, the ultimate power. So I suppose she's describing the Kwisatz Haderach to Irulan, which she should already know about, right? I, w I was wondering the, literally, as you said, I was wondering the same thing. So we know that Irulan was trained by the Bene Gesserit, but we also learn, I think, in Dumasai that she's not a very good Bene Gesserit. So I wonder to, like, what extent she was kind of, like, let in on their inner workings, because she is the Emperor's daughter, and I wonder to what extent they would have trusted her. Um, and when, when um, I read Heretics, Heretics talks a lot about the internal structure of the Bene Gesserit and yeah. how they kind of operate in blocks. Like certain sisters are privy to certain knowledge. Yeah, um, true. You know what I mean? So um, I wonder, maybe Irulan wasn't aware of this. Maybe they didn't ter tell Irulan about this part of the plan. Maybe she was kept in the dark about something like this. And, you know, it's totally possible. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. They, um, the Bene Gesserit play all sorts of games with information. I mean, the funny bit is that the plan is the, the Bene Gesserit plan is, is to put Irulan on the throne and to make her the Empress of the Universe, right? Um, at least prior mm -hmm. to the plan of you know the marriage, um, to Paul and everything. So it's kind of funny the idea that, that they seem to be continuing the tradition of having the Emperor be mostly a figurehead who is manipulated by the Bene Gesserit without the Emperor necessarily yeah. having all that much power themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's funny that we we do get a lot more agency from Emperor Shaddam in this in, in the trailers, it seems. Like, we see Irulan talking with Shaddam, and Shaddam says, deal with this prophet. Send assassins. Yes. Send assassins. And it's not clear whether or not the assassin that he's planning on sending is Fade Ratha. I don't know if that's just the way the trailer is cut or if that's what he's planning because she we hear Irulan say fade ratha he's he's insane or something like that so um i wonder if if they're including an element where it's like the emperor sending fade ratha to kill paul atreides which is very interesting to me yeah that would be very weird that would be another big change from the books yeah i um i i think that yeah i think you're right that the trailer is cut weirdly and it might be that mm -hmm. Um, those are two separate conversations, and when they're talking about Fade Rautha, they might be talking about how, you know, Fade is going to uh, inherit the rule of House Harkonnen and will rule Arrakis under Vladimir's plan, and the potential... Yeah. I, I mean, potentially the plan is for Fade Rautha to marry Irulan and to rule the universe together, right? Like, theoretic... Well, no... Well, that's something that Fade Rautha hopes for in the final chapters of the book. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if the Bene Gesserit necessarily want that. Like, the Bene Gesserit um, end up basically... They, they just want those genes. They want those Kwisatz Haderach genes. So, basically, they want Paul's genes in any way they they can. So, that's why in Dune Messiah, they're like, Irulan, 
you got to get pregnant. You got to get us this baby. And he's like, and she, and you know, Paul won't do it because he doesn't want to give the Bene Gesserit what they want, which is his genes. So they can continue manipulating those bloodlines and make a quiz at Hatterach that will serve them. Yeah. And, and Paul's defiance of that Bene Gesserit plan is, is shown quite nicely when Paul shouts at Gaius in this trailer and, and uses the voice and right. says, silence. And, it's and that... she looks so shaken. Yeah. I can't wait. I can't wait for that scene. Uh, my favorite line in that, in that scene is when he says, try your tricks on me, old witch. Uh, try looking into that place where you dare not look. You'll find me there staring out at you. That yeah. to me is just so epic. And I think he also says something like, um, I remember your Gom Jabbar. You remember mine. I can kill you with a word or something like that. And then the Fremen are all like shook and they're thinking like, oh, the legends say that um, that, that the Lisa Nal Gaib could kill with with his voice or something like that. So they're like shook because he's like still even after he's won or uh, even after he's like very, very close to victory, Paul is still at the end playing on the Fremen's, you know, you know, on those mythologies, still working to manipulate them by saying things that they're going to hear and think, oh, he truly is the one. So it's interesting. It almost becomes second nature to Paul. Yeah, and, and I think there's a really interesting question there of like, is Paul just acting confident and angry and bombastic as a way of cementing his power and his leadership and his authority over the Fremen? Or is Paul, at least partly, genuinely just enjoying the power and enjoying using power over this old witch who has tried to control Paul? Like, is this a sincere emotional reaction, this tantrum almost that Paul is having against Grandma Gaius, you know? Like, I think it's, Paul um... is angry at Grandma. I think he's a little mad at Grandma. <laughs> yeah. In the live I think chat. He definitely is. In the live chat, Disco says he hits grandma with the outside voice. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it, it is, exactly. I think, very much this sort of childish emotional thing as well as this, you know, political thing. So there's always that tension between, you know, using your using your giga brain uh, self-control superhuman abilities, but at the same time being sort of uh, corrupted and altered by your human emotions all at once. Also, one of the other things that I really like about this scene in the book is when Paul just, he like kind of starts exposing the Bene Gesserit a little bit and then guys yeah. is like, shut up, stop talking. <laughs> She's like, stop talking. <laughs> it it's is so funny. It is so satisfying, you know, seeing the <laughs> overconfident <laughs> conniving witch Gaius just be torn apart. And, and we talked before about, you know, we so hope that Aaliyah turns up as she does in the book and because she also mm -hmm. has an enormous amount of fun making fun of Shaddam and Gaius, um, which is super cool. That might be an even funnier moment when, yeah, they're hanging out in the Emperor's like throne room and she's just like giving him all the sass in the world. <laughs> yeah, we need but more s sassy we... psychic three-year-olds in Hollywood. Yeah. So we talked about the Harkonnens a little bit, but like one thing that I have not seen really in any of the promotional material or the trailers is Thufir Howitt. Yeah, Do you true. think that Thufir has to be in this movie, right? You don't think they cut him, do you? Cause yeah. I've been wondering. Yeah, I, I think I heard that there um there were some cut scenes with Thufir from the first movie where Thufir is, you know, captured and interrogated and in the book, it's it's such a uh, strange and subtle plotline, I think, in the book, because Thufir, yeah. well, Thufir thinks that Jessica caused the downfall of the Atreides mm -hmm. and thinks yeah, that Paul so is Thufir, dead. Yeah, yeah, so he gets captured by the Harkonnens, and they give him, in the book, they give him, like, this poison, and only they have the antidote to it, and he has to take the antidote to not be poisoned by the, you know, and um, basically, the, the Baron takes him in because he just lost his twisted Mintat, Pyter, so he needs a new Mintat. Yeah. And over the course of the book, Thufir is basically kind of subtly, you know, playing the Baron and Fade Ratha against each other. He's doing, like, very subtle things to kind of stoke conflict. Like, he, like, places that um, Atreides fighter that's not drugged, replaces him with the one that was... Um, was supposed to be drugged and you know and, and there's a lot of things there's a lot of moments that um where he's trying to subtly manipulate 
House Harkonnen to lead to their da downfall. Oh, look. <laughs> ah, the cat milk. <laughs> cat yeah. milk is great. It's not quite, we don't get any cat milk in the book, but you know. <laughs> Yeah, look, I, I will. Quite like that. I will forgive David Lynch, um, making two fear milk a cat to get the antidote for his poison. Yeah, I. It, it, that's such an extra step. <laughs> it's so bizarre. I love it. It it would surprise me if they include all those details, uh, from the book in this movie because it is such an odd, yeah. confusing plotline with two fear, which, like many of the subplots kind of goes nowhere like i mean kind of the point kind of the point of thufir as a character i think is that it shows how you can be the smartest person in the world and still fail because yeah. you are misled by your emotions like thufir has this sort of rivalry with jessica which leads him to misjudge jessica um yeah and so you know thufir has this really lovely death in the books spoiler where you know, Thufir dies in Paul's arms and he, you know, um, refused. Does, does Thufir get ordered to kill Paul in the end? Which, of course, he doesn't do. So, you know, he gets this lovely death, but it's about the folly of overconfidence and the folly of, you know, being smart is not enough, ultimately. No. So, yeah, yeah. I do wonder if he'll yeah. be, yeah, what, what, how much of a role he'll have. I wonder if they will keep in, if they keep him in in any significant capacity i wonder if they will keep in the element of him you know mistrusting jessica because that was an element that was totally missing from the first movie because you know duncan idaho also doesn't trust jessica and there's a whole scene where he comes in drunk and basically embarrasses himself and there's a scene in, in oh, one of my favorite scenes actually between jessica and thufir in the first which would have been in the first movie but obviously it wasn't which is where she uses the voice on him yeah and then he's like what the heck and then she's like now you know something of the true power of the Bene Gesserit we're not just we're not just these nun ladies we've got real real tangible power we can make you do things that you don't want to do so she ba she's basically telling him if I wanted to make the Duke some do something I could do it easily you know what I mean so she's trying to reassure him but it still doesn't work and he carries that mistrust mistrust throughout the entire book um yeah so I... we'll see if any element of that is present I, I totally agree. Like, that scene is such a... It's a moment where we viscerally feel the power of the Bene Gesserit when, when Thufir and the reader goes, oh, no, like, these these Bene Gesserit are real. Like, that they are more powerful yeah. than we realize, that they can do things that no one else can do, and they are dangerous. Um, we, we don't quite... We, we, it's a shame we don't quite get that in the movie. I mean, we see Jessica beat up Stilgar, which was okay, but I'd, I'd mm -hmm. love to see more of that visceral sense of power. I, even this shot from the first Dune movie, I quite like. We've got, you know, Jessica and Thufir facing each other with the bull head in between, which mm -hmm. in, a, in a symbolic sense almost evokes that conflict between Thufir and Jessica from the books. But yeah, not, not quite included in the movie. Yeah, I would have loved to see it. I was like talking about that scene before the movie, like when the movie first got announced, I was like, guys... I really hope this scene is in there. Unfortunately, it wasn't, but um, that's okay. Because, like you said, hopefully we can see more, you know, visceral visceral elements of the Bene Gesserit powers in this, and maybe the next movie as well. Something else. I Who wanted... knows what's going on with the show? Doing the prophecy, apparently it's called now. Who knows oh. what's happening with that? Yeah, God knows <laughs> what's going on. I haven't got very high hopes, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. One thing I wanted to note before I forget is that th this particular shot of the three sandworms smashing the Sardaukar in battle uh, at the end is very, very similar to this artwork uh, by John Schoenher, which is some, like, Another original old-school illustration of, um, like, from back... I don't know exactly when, but from around the time of publication of June in the 60s or 70s or thereabouts... Uh, I, I really like how it's so similar to this classic artwork, this particular shot. Yeah. It looks to me as though Absolutely. they're really deliberately drawing from the imagination at the time. Because, yeah, this is the same shot. It's fantastic. Yeah. To me, there have been a lot of, like, I feel like direct, clear influences visually from artwork that I've seen. Like some of the headdresses that I've seen, like Jessica wearing and stuff like that, looks, looks very similar artwork that I've seen. A lot of things do, and I'm glad. I'm totally glad that they're 
pulling from you know what people that have read the book and drawn art have um interpreted and taken so i, I really really love the way this whole sandworm sequence looked and i went through and looked at all the different frames and stuff it just looks so good it is unbelievably satisfying to see the fremen ride these worms uh, into battle to really harness desert power in a way that they never have before because it's such an epic moment in in the books it's one of the most epic moments in the book and we've all seen the david lynch version and we know it really it's it doesn't <laughs> quite work because i mean like technologically speaking they didn't really have the ability to make that work visually the way we can now and of course also the dune miniseries is, is very you know it's not the best either <laughs> but it's it's this is going to be amazing to see in theaters to see on like a large screen because it's just like truly epic and this is what they meant by desert power yeah. um because the thing is too no one really knows how many fremen there are except for the fremen the fremen are basically keeping it a secret they're paying people to like they're they're keeping it they're doing all they can to keep their numbers on the low 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 so nobody realizes that there's actually millions of fremen so when these fremen come in on the backs of sandworms it's really a shock to everybody because they had no idea how much power was actually waiting in the desert it's just such a great moment it's such a triumphant moment yeah, and, and it's such a slap in the face to the arrogance and the ignorance of Shaddam. Because this is all about... Dune is all about how to use the mind and how to think. And the Emperor and the Imperials are an example of how not to think. Because they are so arrogant and so distracted by their luxuries and so full of... Decadence. Yeah, that they... That they fail to open their eyes to certain realities and they can't even conceive the possibility that these quote-unquote you know dirty barbarians in the desert have power and have knowledge that they can't even imagine um and so much of it is tied to the environment and the importance of the environment and so while you know while the emperor is hiding in his spherical spaceship which is another like really cool shot um in this oh, trailer yeah. The Emperor's hiding in his, you know, womb-like, egg-like spaceship, trying to insulate himself from, you know, the world outside. Um, while he's doing that, the, the Fremen are out in the environment, learning to harness the environment, and ultimately they come crashing upon Shaddam, break open his steel tent, sm sm smash it all, and, and um, wipe them away. So yeah, I I think the the sandworms as a force of nature is captured really well because they they come out of this storm, really? like we see that the Sardaukar are facing this like dust storm that sweeps in and they're like, what is this? And you know the sandworms emerge from that fog, in a way that makes it really clear that they are nature and you ignore nature at your peril. Yeah, can you imagine the terror of it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you said, it's very effective that they're coming out of the storm like that. And I'm going to have to say this, okay? Game of Thrones. One element of it that I really liked about the last season, a single element. I liked multiple things, but one thing that I liked was when they show the Long Night sequence and you have the White Walkers, they're coming out of this huge snowstorm, right? And yeah. I really like that aspect because it's like they're coming with the winter they're coming with the snow so it really highlighted them as being representative of a force of nature and i kind of see kind of a similar image here almost it's like beware the force of nature yeah 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 i agree because that's One something thing... go on i was just gonna say um since we did see the emperor ship entering entering the atmosphere like at the end of dune there's a bunch of ships hovering above um of doom, above doom like great houses of the land but just watching the events happening because they know that stuff is going down um so i wonder if we are going to get a guild navigator or if that's something that villeneuve really wants to save for dune messiah because obviously the guild navigator edric is a huge part of dune messiah so i'm wondering if we're going to get like a glimpse of it if, if he's going to show it at all because obviously one of them has to be there i mean um there's no movement in this universe without navigators yeah i i th if i remember rightly i think Villeneuve said in an interview that we will see a guild navigator um which yeah i mean it'll be fascinating to see what it looks like because there have been so many different wildly different interpretations of what a spacing guild navigator looks like and 
Um, mm. For those who aren't aware, these are the the mutated humans who take a bunch of spice, which gives them the ability to fly spaceships across interstellar distances. And so they are this sort of uh, monopoly that controls all interstellar spaceflight in this universe. Uh, and yeah. it's all run through the the big psychic brains of these fishy weirdos who live their lives in tanks of orange spice gas. That's what the that's what the navigators are. So um, it'll be interesting to see what they look like uh, if they appear in the next movie. Yeah, yeah. In the book, they're kind of described as kind of like skinny, and they've got webbed hands and feet, and they're kind of like swimming around in these tanks full of like this this spice. <laughs> So, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what they look like. Let's see. Yeah. And I think part of the point of the Navigators is, again, warning us of, like, going too deep down the rabbit hole of, like, you know, the the Navigators have trained their minds in a super powerful way, which is, like, great, but they've kind of dehumanized themselves. They've made themselves too reliant on the spice. They've made themselves blind to certain things. There's all this interesting stuff about how the Spacing Guild relies on the spice on Arrakis, but they never took control yes. of Arrakis because they were worried that they might mess it up and lose access to the spice. Um, but ultimately, their their failure to, you know, control the spice means that Paul is able to come along and control them uh, with the spice. And so, it, it, you know, Frank has all these ideas about dependency, not, not being overly mm-hmm. dependent on a resource and not, you know, over-specializing. You've got to be flexible. And the Space and Guild are too inflexible and too hyper-focused and too weird and fishy to ultimately succeed. I feel like throughout the entire series, like, the um, the balance between the Space and Guild, like, that whole balance is, like, so weird and shaky. And it's almost like he's waiting for it to crumble, waiting for this monopoly to crumble. And it it gets kind of close, like, towards the end of the, of the series. So it's, it's interesting to see how, like, the dynamics... And the power balances throughout the Dune universe shift over time because nothing stays the same. And that's also one of the elements that I love about this series is nothing stays the same. Like we see the progress of, you know, thousands of years throughout this series and everything continues to shift and change and the balance is always moving, right? Even things like the role of the Bene Gesserit in the human universe. It shifts and, and changes. Um, even things like, you know, the role that Arrakis plays in the human universe shifts and yeah. changes, you know? It's, so it's 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 really interesting. And I think that's one of the strengths of Dune is the fact that Frank Herbert was very, very interested in, in what he referred to as the long view of history, right? He, he was interested in the development of humankind over long periods of time, the ways in which we change and the ways in which we, you know, stay the same. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. I I love how, you know, any sense you have of, like, good guys and bad guys is always changing. Like, in this book, it feels as though the Fremen are the good guys defeating the Imperials and the Harkonnens and defying the Bene Gesserit. But then by the second book, the Fremen and, uh, you know, spoilers, the Fremen and the Jihad are are this horrific, destructive force. Uh, And then later in uh, books five and six, the Bene Gesserit, who once were sort of the bad guys and sort of part of the aristocracy, in the later books, the Bene Gesserit are kind of the hope for change and evolution and growth um, and in their ultimate merging with the Yonad Matres and all of that. They really become the mother figures in those last two books. They really, really, like, they're taking care of humanity. And in fact, they're like, yeah, they're, they, they have worlds and planets that they're responsible for taking care of. They're like, literally, like you said, the last hope for the survival of humanity. So really, you know, mom's fighting for her baby at that point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's talk about Fade Rautha, because there's a lot of cool Fade Rautha stuff. Okay in here. So F- Fade Rautha Harkonnen is the nephew of the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen and Vladimir nah, plans, plans to install Fade as the next ruler of Arrakis and uh, Fade has ambitions of his own as well. I um, we- We've seen a bunch of shots of Fade fighting in the arena and in this shot we got to see Fade's twin blades, the white blade and the black blade. And in the mm-hmm. books they talk about how traditionally the white blade is poisoned and the black blade is Mm -hmm. unpoisoned. 
But one of the little tricks that Fade pulls is that he reverses it and he puts the poison on the black blade uh, instead. And so that's one of the ways that he outsmarts and defeats someone in the arena. And so I wonder if, you know, there's this hilarious bit where Fade licks one of the knives. Um, so I wonder if I wonder if he's licking the white knife. It's a little hard to tell, but I think he might be... Well, I, I don't know. Do you think that's yeah, a black knife? Yeah, I would... I don't know. I can't tell. But, um, but we'll continue. I'm sorry, I kind of interrupted you. Well, I'm just wondering if, like, he's licking the knife to show that it's not the poison knife, and this is a way of telling the audience that Fade is is doing this trick, and this is his manipulation. Maybe he's just doing it to be weird, and it is the poison knife. Because I know there are certain poisons or that are only harmful if they come into contact with your bloodstream, right? And you can, you know, consume them. And yeah, not be hurt like like snake venom. Or I don't know. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, no, no. I, I wonder. I agree. Like like maybe that is the poisoned knife, and he's just licking it, and like licking it won't kill you. It's only if it penetrates your skin that it'll kill you. And so that's he's yeah. just he's just being an edge lord and going, "Ooh, I'm not scared yeah. of the poison." That that might make sense yeah. as well. But I I, I, I love really... go on. And I was gonna say I love the I love the look of the Harkonnens in this. I, it's yeah. definitely like a a direct stylistic choice to make them all bald because in the book they're redheads and David Lynch definitely went with the redhead look with them. But um, I, I find the Villeneuve look very striking and very, there's something about them that's very off putting. Look at this guy holding the pillow here. Like, right. Look at this guy. He looks like someone like a Hellraiser character or something. I don't know. Everyone. It's just yeah. the whole look of them is very unnerving and off-putting and just out there and weird. And I really appreciate the weirdness of the Har Harkonnens here. They yeah, aren't I'd... gross like the Lynch ones. I appreciate that they aren't super gross. Yeah, all, all of the boils and the pus and stuff on Vladimir in the in the 80s was, yeah, it, it was a bit much. But yeah, I agree. Like, like the costume and the designs of these Harkonnen slaves, like the weird sort of BDSM, goofy, sensual like gross yeah. it's it's like erotic and it's fat and it's unhealthy and it's bald and it, it's just all these very weird sort of sensory things going on at once uh that i think is just fantastic it's i, I think it's a nice compromise between the goofiness of of lynch's take um and a more sort of menacing realistic sense i i'll, I'll note that to, to the very best of my knowledge the, the harkonnens aren't redheads in the books at least not in Frank Herbert's books. Um, I think in the in the Sons in Herbert's in Brian Herbert's books, some of them are redheads, and in the Lynch movie, some of them are redheads. But in the Frank's books, they say that Fade Ralther has dark hair, um, and Vladimir you might and be right Robans about that. Described. I would have to, yeah. You might be right about that. I would have to go like check again. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, the redhead thing is definitely like entered like that that's definitely how a lot of people think of it so it's definitely you know mm -hmm. made a mark but yeah no i it, so much in this scene is interesting like it looks like they're painting fade black which is interesting yeah i wonder what is going on here if it's like some kind of ritual or if it's some i don't yeah i don't know what that is i, I noticed I was... they did give the baron a bath and like some kind of black goo in the last movie after he was when he was like uh, recovering from the from Leto's poison, Dr. Yui's poison tooth. Yeah, so well, they've got... Maybe it's just some kind of war paint. They've got such a strong, like, black and white um, imagery with the Harkonnens. Like, in those previous trailers, we saw the the pure black and white stark contrast in the arena scenes. I, I wonder if... I, I wonder if painting fade black is part of how they in universe achieve this black and white effect like maybe they paint him black but then they like reverse the contrast somehow with some special sci-fi light and that makes him stark white i don't i don't know there's like there's some there's some ways they could be playing with that yeah i, I it almost makes it, it almost makes me feel like you know the black and white thing shows the duality between Paul and Fade, you know, the yin yang black and white opposite yeah. thing. So I guess that's that part of it as well. Me. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely Paul and, and, and Fade Roth are obviously juxtaposed against each other. 
they are definitely opposites. Um, both um, products of the Bene Gesserit breeding program, and yet they couldn't be more opposite. I think Thade Ratha represents the values of the Harkonnens, and then Paul Atreides is meant to represent the values of, of House Atreides. So they have to come to this inevitable clash. Because, like, I don't know, some of you that have read the book might know that the Bene Gesserit, like, intended... You know, the Paul was supposed to be a girl, right? And so the Bene Gesserit intended a marriage between this Atreides daughter and the Harkonnen son, which would have been Fade Ratha. So they would have been married. Yeah. But since they're not coming together in that way, it's kind of they they have to come to this natural, like, conflict. You know what I mean? It's almost like they're destined to conflict. Yeah. And, and at the same time that there are these differences, you know, there's there's certain similarities as well, because they're ultimately both trying sure. to seize power. Um and... They're both members of the aristocracy. They both come from like, great houses. Yeah, there's lots of similarities for sure. And and they both have a capacity to scheme. You know, like like fade is fade is not purely like an a, an emotional beast like Glosu Raban. You know, we see him plotting with all of this arena slave stuff, and uh, he's not quite as good at, at plotting as Vladimir is. But um, yeah, I don't know. He 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 exists in this sort of shadowy space in between which yeah i don't know he's really interesting he's really cool what Definitely. other what other bits have we not covered well we haven't talked about Aaliyah. yeah or we maybe a little bit yeah because um Definitely, um, Jessica is pregnant. They mentioned that in the last book. So we know that Aaliyah is going to be in the movie to some capacity, but I wonder how they're going to do it. I feel like everyone's been pretty tight-lipped on it. We haven't seen any indication of, like, a child actress playing Aaliyah. Um, and those of, you, those of you that have read the book know that Aaliyah is not a normal little girl. She is awakened, you know, due to, you know, her, her mom being pregnant when she underwent the spice agony. So Aaliyah is awakened with, you know, the memories of her ancestors. So we have the baby, Aaliyah. But um, when people think of St. Aaliyah of the Knife, we're really thinking of, like, the toddler, you know, the talking toddler that's really an adult on the inside, right? So I'm very, very, very curious to see how that's portrayed because that could potentially be a little weird if they were, like, utilizing CGI. That could make it a little bit weird. And I'm, I, I, just, I just don't know. I mean, there are good child actors, I think that could pull it off, right? They did it in the David Lynch movie, and I think that the little girl that played Ali in that movie was fantastic. I know they dubbed her voice, um, which is, I mean, that's something they could potentially do in this one too. But I actually have listened to the undubbed version of Aaliyah from the David Lynch one, and I think the undubbed one is pretty good too. So I think there we could have a child actor portray this character, and I think it would work fine. So I don't think they necessarily need to go the CGI route like some people have been suggesting, but I guess it's kind of up in the air yeah people have definitely been asking about Aaliyah. every time i see a trailer I, I i always read comments of people saying well where's Aaliyah? where's Aaliyah? where's Aaliyah?" because i guess she's so iconic yeah I, I guess at the same time that you know we are surprised that they are they are revealing a lot in these trailers but there is a lot that uh denny is keeping up his sleeve as well including Aaliyah and navigators and thufia's possible involvement that there are still many many surprises to come out of here and I, and I feel like they have a lot of uh, flexibility with Aaliyah. Like, there's going to be a time skip of some amount of time. In the books, it's like a couple of years. But in the movie, they could make it longer if they want to age up Aaliyah. Like, I, I would not be angry if they had, like, a 10-year-old instead of a 2-year-old. Um, I think that would be a yeah. reasonable thing if they want an older actor to play Aaliyah. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, in when I... Uh... When sci-fi did the adaptations of Children of Dune, you know, those kids are supposed to be like 10 years old. And um, in the adaptation, they're like, you know, they're like 18. You know, they're like almost adults, basically. So I feel like aging up is, is a pretty common practice in Hollywood. And I think that it's pretty effective most of the time. And most of the time, it doesn't matter too much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for the super chat from... LMC Doug, who says, uh, who's hoping to get the troll master toddler Aaliyah, because we do love how uh, how sassy Aaliyah is. Thanks for the super chat yeah. from BD, who says, do you think that the that Frank was inspired by Arab people living in the desert for Dune books? 
I always think that. Yes. And um, yeah, yeah, it absolutely is true that Frank was inspired by a lot of different uh, cultures um, from mm. the Arabic world and North Africa uh, to inspire the Fremen. He was he was particularly influenced by a book called The Sabres of Paradise, which is about uh, mm. Muslim cultures in the Caucasus. Uh, who were resisting Russian imperial invasions, and that's that's very much what what the Dune story is inspired by. But but Frank Herbert in interviews, he also talked about uh, Navajo Indians and Kalahari and and the San people and a lot of different peoples from a lot of different places who um, have an interesting relationship to their environment and hu- and who use water sparingly. And uh, Frank drew from many sources. Yeah, many many sources. Like the the Fremen are an amalgamation of a lot of different cultures, too. And also, if you think about um, what they were called before they came to Arrakis, you know, Zen Sunni wanderers. You know, that kind of implies, you know, that you know they also have that influence that's coming from, you know, Buddhism, right? Yeah. You know, um, so there's that as well. Yeah, yeah. It like there's all sorts of cultures mashed together. Yeah, it it mentions the Fremen ancestors originally coming from from Sunni Muslims from Egypt specifically is is mentioned, mm-hmm. um, but it it also emphasizes that it's been thousands and thousands and thousands of years since then, and there have been all these changes and religious schisms and mergers have occurred, and so yeah, it's 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 not just a one to one copy paste it's not an imitation of any one culture it's an imagining of of a new culture with roots from many right. different real cultures and and it's important to note that you know the, the fremen the fremen are most closely inspired by some arabic and islamic cultures but really the whole dune universe has this bud islamic philosophy that is inspired by islamic and buddhist ideas the bene Gesserit um quote and refer to a lot of those ideas and and the atreides and um even the imperials in some in some bits it's it's not just the fremen who are islamic it's kind of a buddhist islamic zen universe that frank has imagined because that is the philosophy that he's interested in yeah and that's also like the aesthetic i think that he what he was interested in um yeah um was i gotta say uh the fremen uh, i'm blanking on what i was gonna say sorry keep, that's keep all good talking i'll hang it in a second thanks for the super chat from deeb who says what do you guys think fade rautha puts in his wheat bix i think that fade rautha <laughs> puts uh the blood of innocence and black <laughs> bath goo into his wheat bix makes sense Max <laughs> says, "Did you did you guys see the shot of the Fremen on a shoreline? Looks like that bit that in Dune Messiah." Um, you, you, you're talking about Paul when he was like standing in front of the water. I think that was probably like a vision or a memory. So I yeah. don't think we're gonna see like Paul on off on Caladan again because I think that was Caladan probably like a vision or a memory of Caladan. Yeah, I, think I that's agree. What or possibly maybe a vision of the future, imagining water on Arrakis, which is the, you know, terraforming uh, dream yeah. of the Fremen. Um, but yeah, we, it's, it's not entirely clear who this is, if it's Paul or Jessica or someone else. I, I think it's possible that Max might also be referring to these shots um, around the Jihad visions in 2021, where it, it, it appears as though this crowd of Fremen are on Caladan, because it's this it's this watery world with all these legions of Fremen standing around, and I, I thought that was a really interesting choice and a change from the books because it it suggests that this holy war that might happen uh, threatens Paul's homeworld specifically. Like it's not just uh-huh. something that will kill billions of people; it's something that will affect Paul's homeworld, and I think that that's a good way of subtly giving more personal stakes to the danger of the holy war yeah absolutely and i remember what i was gonna say um and and about like the religion of the fremen right yeah and how we were talking about how they are kind of like this amalgamation of a bunch of different like cultures and religion um that goes back to what i was saying about frank herbert being really interested in the development of humanity over long periods of time yeah because something interesting that happens with religion over time 
is the fact that it changes and evolves with humans and with the culture that it's a part of, right? Religions over time, you know, split and become new and unique religions. They they merge together. I mean, so I think Frank Herbert was also playing with that idea, you know, when developing, you know, the Fremen culture and Fremen religion. He's playing with the idea of like how cultures, you know, merge together and like like break off and split and, and things like that. So yeah that's 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 the thing i was gonna say (laughs) yeah there's some really fun world building where it mentions oh yeah and then three thousand years ago the third muhammad came along and you know he was sort of a heretic who made this new split off the religion and it it mentions uh quote the 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 maometh sari mahayana christianity zen sunni catholicism and buddh islamic traditions in the orange catholic bible so frank had an enormous yeah he he had so much fun just smushing all these cultures together and imagining this new philosophical um perspective for this for this future universe it's very interesting and i love um like when when you get certain quotes from things like the orange catholic bible because they sound familiar if you're like familiar with certain religious text but they're like not actually familiar like thou shalt not make a machine in the likeness of of the human mind you know it sounds like one of the ten commandments right like the way it's written sounds so familiar but it's like not white (laughs) yeah yeah i I think that's really interesting yeah i i think part of why dune succeeds in creating this feeling of like very real religious ideological weight and authenticity i think that how frank achieves that is that he steals from real religions and real um ideological you know real phrases real quotes that he takes he plucks out of all these different languages mm-hmm. and histories and inserts them into his story and so you know like like a magpie he has accumulated these these real um historical uh, words with mm-hmm. weight and used them for his fiction and it really works for dune because dune is really supposed to be like kind of read as like you know like this potential future history of humanity, right? Yeah. So it's like, of course, they would have bits and pieces of our old cultures and old religions like smattered out about because like really we we all started on this little egg of earth and then little bits of earth went out into the universe and seeded themselves on all these different planets and split up and remerged. And, you know, so of course there's little bits and pieces of everything smattered all about. It just makes too much sense. Hmm. Thanks for the super chat from the Lady Eternal, who says, Say what you will about the sci-fi adaptations, but Barbara Kodatova was amazing as Chani. Powerful and equal to Paul without having to change her character. Love Zendaya, but Barbara knocked it out of the park. Are you a fan of the uh, 2000 sci-fi adaptation? I like uh, certain aspects of it. I'm a, a more of a, I'm a bigger fan, definitely, of the Children of Dune one with James McAvoy as opposed to the Frank Herbert's Dune adaptation. I think it's okay. I think it's good. I think it's more accurate than the David Lynch Dune. Um, But there's certain problems with it. I think like visually it kind of fails a little bit. Like the costumes don't work necessarily that great. I don't really like agree with the casting for Paul really. Um, so there's elements of it that I don't like as as much, and, and I, I don't think Fade Roth is really that great, and I think he's kind of forgettable. But I do I do agree that the casting for Chani is is one of the better casting choices. Although I do think that both Chani and Paul kind of looked too old for the roles that they were portraying. So that's one thing that I do like about the new version. You see these co- these costumes are just like a bit are are kind of out. like Irulan's headpiece, this wing thing that the Emperor has going on. It's just, it's just not okay. <laughs> yeah, they they had a very limited budget, and they spent all of it on hats and yeah. costumes. <laughs> Thanks for the super chat from Ian. He says, "Great collab. These trailers feel four times longer than their runtime." How's that sandworm attack reveal? And Josh says, "Do you think the story will have the same impact if the movie focuses more on action, like Villeneuve has hinted?" They sure are adding a lot of fight scenes and explosions, aren't they? Yeah, that's that's an interesting thing because I feel like I I don't know if I've ever had an experience where I've read a book and then watched an adaptation where the adaptation has had the exact same impact. There's always 
there's always a change in impact. There's always a change in the way it feels because it, it's an adaptation and it has to be different. Like when you're reading something in your mind and you're imagining everything in your own head, it's, it's just gonna be different from the adaptation. So I have no doubt that the impact is gonna be different, but like what I'm hoping for is that it, you know, it stays in line with the themes and ideas that are present in the book, you know, like as, as, as best as it can, you know, the core ideas and themes need to remain intact you can change a lot as long as the core ideas and themes are intact yeah i i think the challenge is that like it's okay to add all these fight scenes and explosions as long as you can connect those fights to the thematic and character and emotional conflicts that are going on like one of the things that i like about the incident where you know paul and the fremen attack gurney and the smugglers uh, and then realize that it's Gurney and they reunite. I, I think part of the point of that is that we see from Gurney's perspective that he's shocked by how Paul has changed. And Paul and the Fremen have become more ruthless and capable and powerful. And so we, we get this outside perspective on Paul where we get sort of shocked by, you know, look at who Paul has become. And, and that connects to, I think, some of the dialogue in this trailer when Chani says, you know, you will never lose me as long as you stay who you are. But of course, inevitably, yeah. because of the power, because of the spice, because of the prescience, Paul inevitably changes enormously, and that will test his relationship with Chani. So as long as they connect those fight scenes and explosions with the emotional and thematic heart of the story, I, I think it'll be okay. It, rem it remains to be seen how much they will succeed at doing that. Well, I do know, you know, from watching like Blade Runner 2049, that Villeneuve is, is is just incredible at action scenes. He he like I feel like he's one of the best. I feel like if I'm gonna watch an action scene, Villeneuve is the guy to do it because like Blade Runner twenty forty nine had some of the most gripping action moments that I've ever seen in any movie. So I'm I'm pretty confident that Villeneuve knows what he's doing and he's not just throwing it in just to throw it in. You know what I mean? Yeah, look, I, I have no doubt that we're going to have a good time, <laughs> regardless. You know, yeah. <laughs> even if they miss uh, some of the subtler aspects, we're, we're going to have a good time. I, I mean, I think that some of the fight choreography stuff in the 2021 Dune movie was not great. Like, you know, Gurney is meant to be the greatest fighter in the universe, but he only briefly kills a couple of Harkonnens. I mean, his scene, his scene with Paul was good. I enjoyed that. Um Duncan's fight choreography I feel like was a little bit hit and miss. So I don't know, like we'll see we'll see how it goes, but 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 I mean certainly in this trailer there's a lot of very spectacular action shots going on. Yeah. Uh thanks for the super chat from Sushi Kebab Guy who says, "Why doesn't the bald boy put poison on both blades?" Also, where was he when Arrakis was getting raided? Love the content. Makes it more fun makes it more fun well, yeah he I... was probably yeah. he's probably yeah. on gaty prime i'm pretty sure when arrakis was being raided yeah good question yeah i i mean it it's not like he's a super well i mean he is a good fighter but he's very young um is it yeah. his he's no fin ring yeah he's no he's no fin ring it, fade is, is is he 16 or yeah he's he's 17 years old um at this point so and and in the uh battle for arrakis against the atreides he would have been yeah about 16 years old so he's not necessarily who you're going to like put on the front lines of the battle for arrakis like vladimir is grooming phage to be the the next political ruler and the leader of house harkonnen like he's not necessarily who you would put in the middle of the battle but w with the knives and and stuff He's preparing here for a ritual gladiatorial combat. This is not a fight for his life, or it's not meant to be a real hot-blooded fight for his life. What what the Harkonnens normally do is they they drug these slave combatants to the point where, yeah. the, where the slaves can't even really properly fight back. So the Harkonnens brag about, ooh, Fade has killed 100 slave gladiators, but... It's not a real dangerous fight because they're all drugged and the, you know fate is so highly trained. So, so it's kind of a farce, um, and the whole you know the blades are part of that. It's a ceremony, um, yeah. and so you know they, they don't give him every possible weapon to win. 
Yeah, and there's a part in the book where kind of through fear because he's trying to undermine undermine the Harkonnens, he kind of sets it up so that the slave isn't actually drugged. So um, he actually almost like gets the better of Fade Ratha. So like Fade is actually isn't as good as like people think he is. He actually almost gets the better of him, but he ends up still dying. But um, yeah, so that's an interesting part. Yeah, F Fade's not like the most dangerous guy in the world. Um, he does, yeah, almost get killed by that Atreides guy. And it's interesting that in this movie, uh, they're using Lanville, who is this movie-only character who was with the Atreides in the first movie, and they're now bringing back as a Harkonnen captive to fight against Fade in the arena, which I think is a nice little connection, which, you know, probably won't be noticed by many, but, but this guy was yeah. in the previous movie as well, which is kind of neat. Mm-hmm. Um, Fade Ratha. Awesome name, too. I always thought the name Fade Ratha was really nice to say. Like, I, all the names and, and terms in Dune, I feel like, really roll off the tongue. And I think that's a skill as a writer as well. Kwisat Sederach, Fade Ratha, you know, Bini Gesserit. They all sound really nice on the lips. Yeah, yeah. There's a sort of, like, sensual quality to Fade Ratha Harkonnen. Which I think connects yeah. to their to their meaning as a family. Um, although you know, I've seen tweets making fun of Dune because it's like you know, it people's names in this story. It's always either you know Quizats, Hadarak, you know Gaius Mahayim, or it's like John or Paul or Duncan. You know, yes, yeah. <laughs> extremely normal names for some of the characters. Yeah. yeah, you might get a weird name like Miles Tag. Well, Miles Tag isn't that bad. It's Miles. Tag is a bit of a weird last name. I've never really heard that one. But <laughs> I love how the later um uh, the later books have a character called Dawi Odrady and Odrady is meant yeah. to be this corruption of the name Atreides over Atreides. thousands and thousands of years. It's it the mm -hmm. language has been twisted and altered and evolved into something else. Mhm. Mm yeah, that's that's really cool because like in the later books, we're still dealing with you know Atreides ancestors, like the main characters are still Atreides ancestors. You know, you got like Lucilla and you know Darwi um, and Miles Tegg. Um, yeah, so it's we're still dealing with the, the Atreides, like thousands of years in the future. Yeah, these certain bloodlines do remain relevant. I I love this shot of the spherical imperial spaceship descending to Arrakis. Uh, it looks like yeah. a meteor. It looks like some destructive artificial outside interloper about to crash onto this planet. I love how artificial it yeah. looks. I love the look of it because I love the, I love how it's entering the atmosphere and it looks like it's coming with such force and speed and it just looks like a, like a bullet, like about to pierce the surface of Iraq. It's like the emperor is coming and bringing all of his rage with him. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a really nice looking uh, at a symbol and i'm just uh, i wish it, there was there was a longer shot of it in the trailer right yeah yeah great uh, looks, I, it also looks like a pokeball i saw someone say that it looks like a pokeball <laughs> a little bit too. does that yeah. mean that emperor shadam <laughs> is a pokemon christopher walken is a pokemon <laughs> perhaps <laughs> in the background i like that there's a moon or something one of the moons yeah which sort of mirrors super cool. the spherical spaceship as though the spaceship itself is also some kind of planetary body something yeah. something otherworldly yeah um, i can't wait to get a a sense of the the scale of this ship cuz like in 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 it coming into the atmosphere right now you can't really see the scale of it so i can't wait to see what it's like beside a building cuz i get the sense that this thing is enormous this is a palace that's flying in the sky, right? So I can't wait to see what the scale of it is like when it lands on the surface. Yeah, I, I think we saw it in the first movie when it lands yeah, I don't know on Arrakis. So the one that lands on um, Caladan when when the yeah Emperor's sorry Emperor comes yeah I didn't, I didn't know if it was the same I didn't know if it was the same one or not because I didn't know if the Emperor was actually on that one or if that was just the ship that sent like members of the lands ride and the the envoy sending the message so i thought maybe the emperor would have like his own vessel that's a palace that like when he wants to travel but it could be the same one it could be the same one well I'm yeah yeah entirely certain. 
I, I think you're right. It might be a different one because this spherical one in the trailers is super reflective. So I don't know if it, it just gets turned onto mirror mode or something, or if that's like a different ship that's um, a different ship to the non-reflective one. Yeah. Still huge no matter what. Like if it, Yeah, it's just a huge... I remember seeing this scene where this thing lands in theaters and just being just blown away by it. It's like the scale of it and the size of it. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think it's great. I, I mean, there's, there's sort of like spherical, like egg sort of symbolism connects with the Bene Gesserit as well because I think they have like this yeah. egg-like ship that's quite nice. It's an interesting Bene choice. Bene Gesserit to... ship is very egg-like. It's very, very. It's like definitely egg-shaped. Hmm. Um. So we got one of our first proper like Shaddam Christopher Walken lines when he tells. His daughter Irulan, deal with this prophet, send assassins. And I love how sort of uh casually he says, like, oh, you know, send assassins. Duh. That that's what we do with problems. We have them murdered. Yeah. You know, like it, it tells you a lot about who Shaddam is that he just sort of casually says, Yeah, violence, obviously. That's what yeah. we're gonna do. And you guys should notice that he says deal with this prophet, not deal with Polytrades, because he's not aware of the fact that Polytrades survived. No one is. So just keep that in mind. No one really knows that Paul is alive. They know that someone is out here mobilizing the Fremen. They don't think it's the son of the Duke Atreides. They're pretty convinced that Paul and Jessica died in the desert. So that's really interesting. Because no one ever thought that the Fremen would take them in. Yeah, which it's so interesting that they're adding this plotline with Irulan investigating. You know, in previous trailers, she was saying, what if Paul Atreides is still alive? Which is like, okay, if Irulan does discover the truth that Paul Atreides is alive and that he is uh, now a leader of the Fremen, is Irulan going to tell Shaddam, hey, dad, I found out that, you know, you know that duke you tried to murder? Yeah, his son is in charge of, of this rebellion on this planet now. Um, I, I don't think Irulan can tell Shaddam that because part of the point of the ending is that Shaddam is shocked to find that the Atreides are alive and the Fremen are attacking. And mm -hmm. so will Irulan discover the truth or not? And if she does discover the truth, why doesn't she tell Shaddam? Is it possible that Irulan's loyalties might be swayed towards Paul? I don't know. Maybe she tells, maybe she tells him and he kind of just like dismisses it or maybe, um, you know, it it could be okay. Maybe Irulan doesn't even know, right, that the yeah. emperor is the one that set up the destruction of House Atreides, right? And maybe he's kind of dancing it around it because he doesn't want her to know. Because, like, like we all know, he had to do it. He had to do it undercover because he can't have the other houses of the lands rad being fully aware of the fact that he helped take out House Atreides because no one would feel safe and it would cause chaos. So it's very possible that Irulan doesn't know that her father is involved or doesn't maybe she she might very well suspect it see in my mind i'm pretty i'm thinking that somehow irulan gets it in her head that the harkonnens and her father were involved with the destruction of house atreides you know what i mean like she realizes yeah. it and um yeah i i could it, it it's gonna be an interesting dynamic i think she's gonna figure it out and i feel like he'll either reject the news or um i don't know i feel like he might just not believe her or not want to believe it i yeah. think that's might be what we're going for here i, I think you're right that irulan doesn't know that her father the emperor caused the downfall of the atreides because in the first uh trailer for this movie irulan says in the shadows of arrakis lie many secrets but the darkest of them all may remain the end of house atreides so it yeah. seems like she doesn't know and she wants to find the truth. And so I guess Irulan's going to have this moment where she's like, oh my god, my father uh, did this horrible thing trying to defeat the Atreides. And the question is, like, will Irulan be surprised by that? Because in the books, Irulan knows that her father, the Emperor, is horrible. In the books, Irulan knows that her father has probably tried to assassinate her several times. It's mentioned in the books. So maybe they're going for something different in the movie where Irulan doesn't realize how awful her father is yet. And, and she discovers over the course of this movie that, that her father is more of a monster than she had realized. Yeah. I definitely see a process of her discovering over time that her father is actually the one that was behind it all. 
Yeah, I definitely, I definitely think that's where we're going because we need to give Irulan something to do in this movie. I think so. That's definitely going to be one of the subplots is her um, figuring stuff out, and yeah. figuring out her father's involvement. Mm -hmm. It's just so interesting. The, the thing is, too. Go on. Well, I was just going to say that Irulan is loyal to Paul Atreides for the most part. I mean, definitely her loyalty is like kind of like wavering in Dune Messiah. But by the time we get to Children of Dune, she is loyal to House Atreides and loyal to Paul's children. So I I, I don't think... Irul yeah, okay. Yeah, she she goes back and forth, doesn't she? And, and I guess mm -hmm. it makes sense yeah. that if Villeneuve is hoping to make a movie of the next book, Dune Messiah... It does make sense that he's he's starting to give Irulan more agency and exploring Irulan's loyalties more. But it'll be interesting to see how that affects the ending, because in the ending of the of the first book, Irulan is still very much a pawn. She doesn't have a lot of agency yeah. when she just gets handed to Paul and told to marry him. So I wonder if, you know, in the movie, are they going to have Irulan choose to marry Paul and choose to ally with Paul Partly because she's discovered that her father, the Emperor Shaddam, is uh, more of a monster and a killer than she than she realized. I, I guess that's one possible angle they could be going for. You might be right about that. I think that might be what we see, as opposed to it just being like, okay, now marry him, and you don't get a choice. I think we might see her, yeah, yeah. Because her, from her point of view, I mean, Paul Atreides... It'd be a great marriage for her, you know what I mean? If she actually could, you know, produce an heir, she'd be, you know, queen of the universe. I mean, it's not like it's it's a bad marriage for her, you know what I mean? It's a great political move, honestly. Yeah, uh, but and, and the extent to which she's acting on her own personal desires and ambitions versus acting for the Bene Gesserit's plan is another True. aspect of it. Because, like, her relationship with Gaius is going to be interesting because they also have this interesting relationship in the books where Ga Gaius doesn't respect Irulan very much no. um, but they have this sort of mentor-mentee relationship nonetheless and she uses her where she can like any place where she can utilize Irulan she makes use of it yeah and Irulan kind of just seems like this kind of a fumbling character that's kind of like this almost like this anxious Bene Gesserit that doesn't have very good emotional control. And it's another, um, yeah, I, I forget. I, I think it's Dune, Messiah, yeah, it's Dune Messiah where they're all sitting at the table and Irulan is visibly getting very, very frustrated at the conversation that's happening. And it's like, yeah, it's it's interesting. Because I it, um, definitely in Dune Messiah, you see Frank Herbert play with the idea of like Ir Irulan like grasping for more agency and control and being denied it and denied it and being very frustrated because of that so yeah yeah you kind of feel sorry for her because because like you definitely I, feel sorry for her I, I think compared to paul and gaius and jessica who are literally these superhuman psychic giga brains irulan seems like fumbling and foolish compared to them but i think that irulan Irulan still is a, a very smart, capable person. She's just not as capable yeah. as these these superhuman people, um, which sort of, yeah, it, 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 she's in a really unfortunate position, and and that's you know part of why she spoiler plots against Paul in book two is is because she's been put in this really just uncomfortable political, emotional it's, uh, situation. It's... It sucks for Irulan. Yeah, it really, really, really ends up, like, sucking. Yeah. The the, the thing it just keeps coming back to, I, I think, for me, is, like, just to, to what extent are they going to capture the message of Paul's rise being kind of terrible? Like, there's this text that shows up in this trailer that says, Destiny arrives. And so, you know, I, I, I hope that they are... Uh, they're leaning on this, you know, classic fantasy hero journey stuff so that they can undermine it and subvert it later is, is I hope, what they're doing. Because I'm sure there's studio executives behind Villeneuve saying, oh, we don't want Paul to be a bad guy. We don't want to talk about yeah. the, the Jihad and the Holy War. Let's make this an, an optimistic, uplifting story. Let's have it rain at the end, like in the David Lynch movie. Oh. I really hope they stick the oh, landing and, and get the more cynical message in yeah. there. I wonder if 
sometime towards the end of the movie will like his like I, I get the sense that throughout it paul will be having these fragmented visions of the future and he's just not really sure what's going to happen i wonder if if sometime by the end of the movie we'll see paul have a vision that's more clear of the future and maybe we'll see the jihad marching out into the universe and the and the atreides flag and the shrine of his father's skull and we might see like a like almost like a quick clip show of like some of the things that are going to happen in the future like okay yeah now it's going to get really bad from this point on like just just like this ominous vision that hints at the things to come so it kind of solidifies okay now you've gained this victory but the things that are yet to come will be far more terrible than anything that would have happened other otherwise that could be an interesting thing and that kind of like hypes up the next movie in a way i don't know if they do something like that or not yeah yeah something to make it more like explicit um visually would make a lot of sense i agree I, I think it's interesting also these um we get these shots of fade standing in some kind of big arena place um in front of a crowd that's like cheering for him and that's something that we, we don't get to see something like this in the book not like separate from the arena anyway I, I love the architecture here you know it looks like ribs or it looks like the sort of ribbed shape on the inside of an animal's mouth or something like they've been swallowed by a whale yeah, yeah. Very eager, eager. So, so I really like the visuals of this scene, and I wonder what the um what the point for the story will be in this scene. Is is this like presenting Fade to the people, saying Fade is officially the the yeah. heir to to Gaiety Prime, and I wonder if that's what they're doing. I think you, I think your um intuition is spot on with that. I think Fade is being announced as like the knob bearer, and it's like, yeah, this is the future leader of House. Harkonnen, behold the future leader. I think that's exactly what's going on here. Yeah, and it's a wonderful comparison to uh, the shots of Paul in Siege to Beer when, when he steps up uh, as a leader and he is presented to the crowd, having these sort of parallel um, scenes, seeing the differences and the contrasts between them is going to be really cool. Yeah, I definitely agree. I like I like this uh, leather thing that Fade has in this image here. <laughs> yeah, well, Fade's Fade's outfit is cool. I I feel like his his sort of necklace thing looks like it looks like a chain because the Harkonnens are all yeah. about slavery and stuff. Um, lots of really great point. subtle costumery going on. Um, yeah, Hyper in the live chat asks about Sting. Um, we, we were talking about the uh, year 2000 miniseries before, not the uh, 1984 Lynch movie, because the Lynch movie is the one where Fate is played by Sting, and there, he is yeah. uh, very memorable in that role, for sure. Very memorable. <laughs> I reckon we might wrap up this live stream shortly, uh, if people have questions that they're burning to uh ask or topics you'd like us to discuss chuck it in the chat chuck it in the super chats and we'll uh, have a look um in the meantime quinn i heard that you are releasing a comic book yes uh the 30-day campaign just finished running but you can still get the book in demand it's called the lie behind the star it's a science fiction graphic novel it's my second graphic novel uh, you can check out the link in the description if you're interested. Check out like the trailers and the images that we have listed. It's basically this uh, semi-dude inspired, inspired by a lot of science fiction things that I read. Um, um, it's got elements of cosmic horror and adventure. Um, and yeah, it's been really exciting to produce it. And it's been kind of a process that's taken about a year and a half to finally get it to this point where we can start doing the pre-sales and it's been really good so far we were like over 500 percent funded so it's definitely happening and it's it's very very exciting so anybody can check it out if you're interested link in the description thanks guys oh, oh congrats on the uh crowdfunding success thanks man well, what is thanks, some man. of your um what are some of your influences because i know your previous graphic novel tarja had a lot of sort of witchy benny Gesserit energy to it yeah what, what are some of the ideas and influences in this new one well uh a big major influence is the work of octavia butler who did a lot of you know afrofuturism 
Uh, last year, I read her series G Xenogenesis, which is about like the end of the human race and these aliens that intervene to save the human race. But they offer us salvation through change. Um, they basically want to merge with humans. Um, so essentially, humans will stop existing and become something else, this hybrid of them and, and humans. So this is the way this particular race breeds. And there's just something about the way Octavia Butler has these very specific ideas about humanity and the way we engage with each other. And she confronts you with those ideas in a very, like, almost uncomfortable way in her work in a very visceral way that makes you really, really have to, like, think about what you're, like, reading and seeing. And I was just very inspired by that. So I wanted to create uh, a story that, you know, was kind of maybe a little bit uncomfortable in a similar way that took um, things like my knowledge about the world and, you know, how I grew up and and incorporated them into this story. Um, right. So I have the element of like these um, these mushrooms that people that the specific civilization of people consumed over time and through the consumption of these mushrooms, certain members of the society gained the ability to hear this signal that was coming from outer space that these mushrooms were also responding to and connecting Ooh. to. And over time, and over time, they kind of developed this advanced civilization after being changed by these mushrooms. And over, um, they developed biological technology, the ability to produce all sorts of chemicals and biological technologies, weapons, all forms of technology. Um, and ultimately, they create a biological spaceship and send nine young people who have the ability to strongly hear the signal, the Kimura, they call it. And they, of course, attach like various, you know, religious uh, connotations to this idea of the Kimura. So they're going into outer space to find it, this potential goddess, to figure out what it is that has been sending the signal and changing them. Um, so that is what it's about. And like I said, it's got elements of cosmic horror and adventure. And I'm really excited about it. Really, really excited about it. Awesome. And yeah. Now, one of the things I love about your channel is that you cover so many different sci-fi stories. You, you've read mm -hmm. so widely and, and delved into so many different uh, classic and and more obscure sci-fi series. So um, I'd love to see how all those different, really? all that sci-fi knowledge goes into this this original story. That's um, that's really cool. Really? So there's a link in the description for everyone to go and uh, check it out. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Um, all right, I think we will wrap this up shortly. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Mods. Thank you, Schubert Reads, for moderating the live chat. Uh, this live stream will be available as a podcast as well. You can listen on a podcast app or on Spotify or wherever. Uh, please like this live stream. Please subscribe to Alt Shift X and subscribe to Quinn's Shout Ideas. Out, uh... Shout out to my friend Mike Blacklist Universe in the comments there. He does the all the covers for George R. R. Martin's comic books, the A Song of Ice and Fire comics. Cool. Uh, and oh, and you've got a podcast as well, right, Quinn? I do. It's called Cosmic Chronicles Podcast, and we do bi biweekly episodes, and um, we cover various science fiction topics and talk about their relation to the real world. We usually start with the base of you know, like a set of books or a movie, and we just basically talk about ideas that are related. So yeah, we've been doing that for a few months now, and it's been going pretty swimmingly. Sweet. Uh, and as for Alt Shift X, at the moment we are working on finishing a big video about Jon Snow called The Real Jon Snow. I think that will be done in January, I think. Uh, and it'll be very exciting to get that out because it's the biggest Alt Shift X video ever. We will do more nice. Song of Ice and Fire videos. We will do more Dune videos, especially when uh, the second Dune movie comes out on March 1st. We'll do more House of the Dragon videos, weekly live streams and videos when House of the Dragon Season 2 comes on. And, uh, and yeah, there's lots of cool stuff happening. Are you going to cover the three body problem, Quinn? The the Netflix show, yeah, most certainly, absolutely. I've done like, as you probably know, like a few videos on it so far. So yeah, I'm definitely going to talk about the show when it comes out. It seems like they're changing a lot, but I'm definitely interested in seeing what they do with it with the material. Interesting. D and D strikes again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Cool. All right. Well, lots of cool stuff 
coming up on Quinn's channel and on Alt-Shift-X, and uh, I'm excited for all of it. Yeah, me too. Thanks for listening, guys. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on, Quinn. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. Anytime, man. Anytime. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next time. Cheers. Bye, guys.